Welcome back. So let's continue what we started. So again, we are in the middle of the appetizer for big data for engineers, right? This is beyond information systems for engineers. I'm just giving you the motivation for why there was actually a continuation of database research after the 2000s. Uh, and uh, the, the main driver was that if you look at what happened in uh, 70 years, that's a lot, right? 70 years, we had this absolutely huge hard drive of one meter 50, one meter, one meter 50 or diameter that barely stored five megabytes. And today we can store uh, 20 terabytes in this little volume. So if you look at the capacity per unit of volumes, it actually increased by a factor of 200 billion uh, when I computed that. Uh, but now, how did the throughputs improve? The speed at which we read from the disk, it's right there. You see it, this little thing there. It actually barely, in comparison, it only improved by a factor of 10,000. And the latency, the, the time we need to wait, it, it got a bit better, so shorter, but only by a factor of eight. What's the conclusion here? We are in big trouble. We are in enormous trouble. That's why we need big data, because we now we have huge amounts of data. That's not the problem. We can store them, but we just cannot read them fast enough. The, the, the way we read them cannot compete with that. Um, so this is just a logarithmic scale to, uh, to compare. Uh, just to give you an example, just so you visualize the big trouble that we are in, big data, big trouble. So imagine you have a book uh, today of 600,000 words, that's the capacity. Uh, the throughputs, that the number of words that you can read every minute, let's say a thousand words per minute is what you can read from the book. And the latency, that would be you standing up, going to the shelf and getting the book. That's the latency to read the book. So let's say one minute of latency. So how much time do you need to read the book? So in that case, you can neglect the latency. One minute is nothing because if you just do the division of 600,000 words divided by a thousand words per minute, you actually get 10 hours. That's quite reasonable, right? In 10 hours, you can read the book and you're done. All right. Here's the thing. Let's imagine that in two centuries from now, in 20, in, in 2222, uh, in 2222, we actually improved uh, the, the capacity that we store in the books by the same factor as for the computer. And that's two centuries for the, for the, the hard drive. It was, it was only 70 years. So let's imagine that we multiply by 200 billion uh, I think I took that factor, the number of words, 200 billion, but we only improved the speed by 10,000. I'm using exactly the same factors, the historical factors we've had on the hard drive. Then what you end up with, there are so many zeros, I cannot even count them. So it's 120 quadrillion, billion, quadrillions. Yeah, I think 120 quadrillions, you see, I have to think and 10 million words per minute. So I just multiply by 200 billion and by 10,000. How much time does it take to read the book fully? 22,800 years. That's basically more than the duration of modern humankind right, like, since we started settling down. Uh, this is what I mean with big troubles. It took 10 hours to read a full book. Now it takes 22,800 years. We are in big trouble with the drives. So what do we do? We can actually parallelize. That means that instead of just having a single drive and you read sequentially, you just have a thousand drives and you read from the drives in parallel, right? It's as if you would split the book to millions of persons and every, person's read, uh, every person reads a page and then that will not take 22,000 years, right? And uh, that's the trick, right? And of course, in big data, this is what we do. This is why we have the, the data centers with the clusters and so on, because we parallelize things so that it doesn't take 22,000 years to display a web page on your laptop, right? So we have plenty of machines in a data center like that, and we look at that in big data for engineers. And the second thing we do is batch processing. But in fact, that's not really new because what I explained about the blocks, you know, of eight kilobytes that you write and read in blocks on the disk, this is a form of batch processing. Batch processing is the idea that you group things together rather than doing them one by one. Uh, imagine that you have to write your uh, New Year's wishes. Uh, maybe you don't want to, to write a postcard every day. Maybe you want to have 100 postcards and then you sit for an afternoon and you write them all, right? Uh, so this is called batch processing. You group things together in order to reduce the latency. So we will look at that in Big Data for Engineers. And in fact, this is all what big data is about. We have technologies uh, 
that uh, improved so much that the capacity has completely uh, uh, overtaken the speed at which we read the data. So the discrepancy between capacity, throughput, and latency led to all these new technologies, uh, AGFS, MapReduce, Hadoop, uh, Spark, and so on, MongoDB, all of these things are driven by that. And there's examples of why we need that. In astronomy, we try to map the whole sky. That's absolutely gigantic. The amount of data we have is in petabytes. Uh, we now uh, store uh, DNA uh, also to store data. People manage to actually execute, uh, they, they basically manage to use DNA as a database, as a relational database. So they stored relational tables on DNA. Uh, and uh, the, uh, one of the, 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 the people who did that did uh, uh, his PhD at ETH. Uh, so this is quite amazing what can be done now. That's a beautiful illustration of data independence, right? Because now you can just, instead of a hard drive or a computer, you just do it on DNA. Uh, so the scope of our lecture was not machine learning of AI. It will also not be the case in big data for engineers. It's just databases, but, but the modern ones. So this is what we'll do. We'll look into trees, into syntax, uh, into storage systems distributed, into how we query data with Hadoop MapReduce, with Spark. Uh, and we will look at MongoDB for document storage. We'll look at the JSONic language, which is just like SQL, but it's uh, used when the data doesn't fit in tables. Okay, so I would like to issue a big thank you to the TA team here. You're here, Manuel, on the on the slide. You look, everybody is here. So big thank you to the to the TA team for uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, driving the exercises, the quizzes, and so on, and now preparing the exam during the semester. I think I suggest we give them a big round of applause to the to the TAs. Thanks, in the name of the TA team. <laughs> thank you as well. All right, uh, I also need, so this is a requirement by ETH, right? We have the course evaluation that you kindly filled uh, two weeks ago and uh, we we uh, uh, we uh, then share uh, once it's out with the lecture. So uh, these are the scores here. So of course, I, that makes me absolutely super happy that uh, that you understand what I've been telling you and uh, that you that you uh, that I'm motivating you. So this is uh, this is really something that uh, that makes me super happy. Uh, the TA team also uh, did a great job, you see, for the, the preparation of the, of the exercises. Uh, also a top grade in there. Um, there was good interaction and exchange. The condition seems to have been good. So, so I hope the hybrid mode that you can come to the lecture hall, you can follow online if you prefer. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is very encouraging. And of course, that's, uh, that's an encouragement to, uh, to continue to do things uh, in that way. Uh, when I came of feedback, uh, oh, let me also go on that side. Uh, so the satisfaction with the course units, uh, that really means a lot. So we, we are really, really happy that you appreciated it. In terms of the comparison to other courses, so we try to adapt the difficulty, right? Is it too easy? Is it too difficult? So here we want it to be in the middle, right? In the middle is exactly the sweet spot that the, the knowledge you require is, is just right, al dente. Uh, the time required seems to have been also uh, in the, at, at the right place. Uh, and it's great that the lecture inspired you. So typically what I like to compare is this one here. So this is basically the before subjects in, uh, before you started the course compared to at the end of when you started the course. So that's how we can measure if we, if we uh, inspired you to, uh, to be interested in the subjects. Um, an item of feedback was that some of you um, uh, talked about like, do we have a textbook or is, are there any lecture notes? And this is what led me to perhaps to really clarify that yes, there is this book that we mentioned at the start of the semester, the database book. Uh, and I made sure that you have all the chapters and everything you need uh, to prepare for the exam that is now in uh, roughly two months, right? Uh, what uh, I found very funny is that apparently the, the, the team doing the course evaluations wanted to leave something open as an exercise. And for this question right here, I don't have the fancy charts. Instead, they gave us the raw data. So this is what I had in the PDF. Uh, turns out it's uh, with a SQL group by, you should be able to put that together and then uh, get, the, get the average. So I'll just leave that as, a, as an exercise uh, inspired by the uh, course evaluation team. Um, I think that's... Right, my last slide. So uh, now we'll uh, go ahead and do the quiz. So we'll play uh, a little bit. I'll uh, ask plenty of questions. Uh, I'll explain the rule. Oh, is there a practical question on the chat? 
Okay, then I'll, I'll ignore. Okay. Um, so uh, let me explain the rules of the of the quiz. What's going yes, to yes? There is a I was in the wrong chat. Oh. Um, uh, there is two credits more for big data for engineers than this course. Will the format be similar? Yes, so let me explain the difference. So the main difference is that big data is only for computer scientists and data scientists. Big data for engineers is for all other departments. That allows me to explain more of the prerequisites that computer science students already know. For big data for engineers, I can take more time to make sure to give you the knowledge. Uh, in big data, I also go into graph databases, uh, which is not covered in big data for engineers. And uh, in big data, we cover data cubes, uh, but for the, the other departments, data cubes are covered here in information systems for engineers. So that's also part of the difference. In terms of lectures, there are three hours of lecture in big data and two hours in big data for engineers. So a bit less uh, material. Question was more regard uh, the comparison of big data for engineers and information systems for engineers. Oh, okay, I see. No, not big data, big data for engineers. Yeah, sorry about that, now I get it. Um, so, uh, for big data for engineers, we are pushing the limits because it's less standard, uh, uh, you know, standard textbooks uh, courses, right? In information systems for engineers, that's what is taught on the bachelor's level at many universities. Big data for engineers is more cutting edge, right? So uh, we look at a more diverse set of technologies, you know, data lakes, uh, MapReduce, Spark, and so on. So it's a bit more involved uh, in terms of uh, what you need to learn and practical exercises. Uh, here in this lecture, for example, there, there was, um, uh, 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 let's say that every week was very close to every other week, right? In the, in the way that it fits. So it's a bit less, uh, less it requires less uh, uh, additional time. But in big data for engineers, you need a bit more standalone work, right? So need, you need to read a bit more things and every week to make sure that you that you learn the technology, right? It's more like standalone modules, right? They all fit together, of course, in the big scheme of things, but uh, it's slightly more involved, right? Okay, I think that's all from the chat. But it's really worth it, I have to say, because so with information systems for engineers, you can now do semester projects or bachelor's thesis or master's thesis whenever your data fits in a table. I hope now you will consider PostgreSQL as, as a storage layer. But you have cases in real life that the amount of data is too big or your data doesn't fit into tables. And here, big data for engineers can help you. You can also work, can also be useful for bachelor's thesis, master's thesis, semester projects. Uh, then you just, uh, you will learn how you can store your data on, on your hard drive, on your laptop or on HDFS on a cluster, and how you, qu you can query it with newer technologies than PostgreSQL, right? So this is, uh, this is complementary, uh, I would say. Yeah, one last question. Uh, will the big data for engineers also be offered in hybrid mode? Is that clear already? What uh, mode will be? Already has the plan, yes. Yeah, okay. that, that's that's forever. I mean, we learned from the pandemic, so now I, I really hope that I can continue to offer you this uh, this choice between attending in the in the lecture hall or online. Yeah. Oh, I see a nice smiley here. Okay. Very good. So, uh, shall we go to the quiz? Do you have more questions? Right, let's go to the quiz. Here, here it goes. It's Icegager Hundert. So I'm going to ask every one of you to stand up. Now you can you can stand up. Um, and on Zoom, you can all raise your hands. So everybody who wants to participate in the quiz, you can raise your hands by clicking on the on the reactions. So I see plenty of participants. So what's going to happen is that I'm, I, I'm going to ask you questions on the clicker app. So you need your phone or your laptop or whatever. You need to take it with you. And I'm going to ask you questions. And then it's just like in the TV show that every time you, you get it right, you stay up. And every time you get a question wrong, you have to sit, right? But you can continue to participate, right? I, I, I don't want to exclude anybody. So uh, th th there's the, you know, the competition for whoever stays until the end. Uh, but even if you see it because you got one wrong, you can still continue to answer and play along with everybody, right? Uh, all right, and on Zoom, you, you'll just uh, lower your hands uh, whenever you get one wrong. It is all based on trust, you know, there's nothing involved. I mean, uh, basically what I have for the, for the winners is some chocolate like Toblerone, uh, this uh, Lindkugel, and also, uh, also a Twix. So this is what I have. So you see that it's, it's not like, uh, um, um, 
um, you know, th there's nothing much involved, so I trust you. Basically, we we don't have to uh, uh, to um, to check everything. All right. Um, okay. Let me switch over. What we're willing to do for some chocolate, right? Oh, <laughs> yes, that's true. All right. So let me just make sure the page is loaded again. Oh. Uh, I just noticed that I didn't plug my computer to electricity, so it could have disconnected everything right in the middle of things. All right, so now I'm back here. Now I need to share my screen for Zoom. Uh, where is that? That's right here. Okay, so I, you see all the questions that, uh, that I have right here. Are the words clear? Shall we go? Shall we go ahead? All right. You can see my screen on Zoom, right? So let's start with this question. What is the main benefit of data independence? Is it that tables are fully uncorrelated with each other? Or is it that it's possible to change the physical layer while keeping the logical layer, which keeps the door large open for optimizations? Or is it that the data is fully disaggregated? Or is it that it prevents implementing support for a data shape on top of a system that was built for another data shape? So as we make progress, the time to answer will get a bit shorter. Here I give more time, it's the first question. Just counting the number of people in the room, maybe 10, 15, plus 20 on Zoom, 30, 40. Yeah. So what I do every time, uh, so you, you put your questions in there, and then I will ask Manuel uh, what, uh, what his answer was. You can also put it in the system. Uh, I just try to sync it in such a way that I, I, I stop the quiz, then you answer right away. Uh, so that it cannot influence the, the answers, right? I, I can also write it down on paper. I trust it, you. It, it, this is all based on trust, so yeah. I, I trust you. I mean, it will be embarrassing either way, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, so we have 39, I think it's about right. Does anybody need more time? Is everything working? Right, on Zoom too? It's all good? All right, so uh, let's see how we think things. I'm going to count to zero, and then you answer right away. Five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Oh, now it's already showing. Yeah, so, so, so I, I wrote down oh, option okay. two. So, yeah. what answer did you give? Option two. Option two. Okay, yeah. so that's the correct answer indeed. You know, you have the logical layer, and you can swap the physical layer without changing the logical layer, right? So now, uh, if you can stay up, if you got it right, another one, otherwise you can sit, but you can continue to participate, right? You, you, you can still continue to answer to all the questions, right? Um, okay. So. Down 15 people, I think. And two in virtual goal and three, six, seven. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, people seem to be honest. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we just don't overdo things, right? The, the goal is to have fun, it's just to have fun together. All right. So. Uh, let's go to the second question. The second question is, what is the name of the standard model for querying table? Is it the OLAP model, the cubic model, the SQL model, the relational model? Everybody can answer. Also, if, uh, if you, uh, if you um, didn't get the previous one right. Oh, we have people in the waiting room just making sure that can answer too. Thirty-nine, forty. We are approaching. I think we were above 40, 42 for the other one. Okay. Okay. Do we see a number of raised hands? By, oh yes, 21 here. And uh, yeah, and as we spend more time, the number will go down. All right, so did you write your answer? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to close now. What is your answer? Uh, it was number four. The yeah. relational model, this is correct. This is called the relational model. This is the model that we used for 
querying tables. Okay. So on Zoom. 14 people on Zoom. 14, yeah. 14. All right. Let's continue with which one of the following is not a relational algebra construct? Dicing, selection, projection, join. What is not part of the relational algebra? Thirty nine. Everybody can continue, right, for the answers. You can really continue to answer everything. 40, 42. All right, did you write it down? Yes. Right. Okay. So, what did you write down? Uh, when was dicing. Dicing, indeed. Yes. This is for what shape? Cubes, exactly. This is for cubes, the dicing. Okay. So here we had almost uh, a majority. All right, um, but here it's totally okay to make mistakes because that's not the exam, right? So this has absolutely no consequence. Uh, what does SQL support? Uh, DDL and DML or DDL only, DML only or neither DDL nor DML? Five, forty one, forty two. Do you have your answer written down? Yes, I have. We're going to stop in a few seconds. Four, three, two, one, zero. By the way, this applies to the exam as well. You should always answer. Even if you don't know, pick a random answer. There are no negative points. We want to encourage you to give answer. Never hesitate. Um, so what did you write down? I did two is number one. Two is number one. Yes, indeed. Both DDL and DML, because you can do insert queries, you can do create table and so on, but you can also do select from where and so on, right? So this is all, uh, all there. So create table, drop, colon and so on would be DDL and DML is everything that is with select from where as well as insertion and uh, and um, updates and deletion of tuples. All right. What are the numbers now? So we have, we have one, 12, two, five, 10. 12 and here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So we are at 22, 22 still in the game. All right. So, which adjectives characterize SQL? Functional, imperative, declarative, set-based. Multiple answers possible. So we have to get all the correct answers. Yes. Okay. Functional, imperative, declarative, set-based. Which adjectives characterize SQL? Thirty one takes more time this time. Thirty five. Forty. Did you write your answer down? Yes, I did. Okay. And okay. I now know why we don't include these kinds of questions in uh, exams yes. <laughs> because they're tough. <clears throat> right. So it's functional, declarative, and set based. What did you say? I only said declarative and set-based. I did not oh include my, functional. Wow, what happened? So first, you guys won against Manuel because you, you, you last longer. And we have very few survivors. Two here. How many on Zoom? 
Five. Five. So seven. Seven. Wow. This is this is getting uh, this is getting closer to having a winner. What's the definition of functional? Oh, let me read it. Okay, the, the definition. So let me start with the easiest. Declarative is you say what you want, you don't say how. That's declarative. Set-based means that you don't return single values, but collections of values, right? So it, uh, it's, uh, it can be a million values at the same time. Um, functional means that uh, on the abstract level, a functional language is based on the abstraction of mathematical functions, right? So it's basically, it can be written as a chain of function calls. But of course, in a functional language, it doesn't mean that you see the function call parentheses and so on, because in fact, there is some cosmetic, you put lipstick on top, that you have so-called expressions uh, in, a, in a functional language, right? Uh, and each expression, in fact, can be seen as a mathematical function that uh, takes as parameters the what is inside, the nested expressions, and returns value to the upper ones. You can understand it, for example, when you have in SQL select from where inside a select from where, you can see the outer select from where as being a function, and it takes as a parameter the table returned by the inner select from where, right? That's the intuition. So this is why it's called the functional language. And when you have a functional language, it can be described without a computer, purely mathematically. Like every function returns a mathematical value and you have a cool formal framework for these values, and you can do a lot of theory uh, with that, all right? So this is functional. You know, it's like a non-functional language. Yes, Python, Java, and so on, because they, they are imperative. With you, uh -huh. you have side effects. In a functional language, you don't have side effects, right? You just return mathematical values. But in Java, in Python, in C++, you change things, right? You, you modify things. You, you update the value of a variable, and so on, and so on. You increment counters. This is not functional, right? But people tried to mix the two and tried to introduce side effects inside functional languages. I think it's called monads or something. It's a, it's a beautiful framework, right? Uh, but this is the idea. So uh, uh, Java is not functional. It's not declarative. And it's not set-based, right? You can still have lists, but a list is still a single object. So you have a pointer to an object. OK? All right, let's continue with the seven of you. Still have time. Uh, what is the first normal form? Everybody can continue to answer again, right? So what is the first normal form? Is it requiring that the left-hand side of any non-trivial functional dependency is a super key? Is it a constraint requiring for values in the table to be atomic? Is it requiring identical support for all tuples in the same table? Or does it require that the values in a column are part of the same domain? That's the first normal form. By the way, another way of explaining what a functional language is, is in terms of calculator. A calculator computes addition, multiplication, and so on. So you can write an expression with the numbers and plus and times and divide and so on and parentheses, right? This is a functional language and the functions would be plus, minus, and so on. And it manipulates numbers. So a functional language can be seen as a generalized calculator it's just that the values don't have to be numbers. The values can be tables, the values can be anything, but they are still mathematical objects. And what you do, the functions do not have to be addition multiplication. They can be selection, projection, and so on and so on. You can see it that way as well. All right, let's come to the first normal form again. 37 votes, 39. Okay, has any everybody of the seven uh, survivors Answered? Yes? Yes? On Zoom as well, I assume? Otherwise? We have two left now, it seems. Oh, what happened? Why? There, there... Maybe some people were. Still... Ah, okay. So there's four survivors. Indeed. Okay. So, and the two on Zoom you have answered? Um, now they have to identify themselves. Oh, actually, I can see who it is. Right? Says we, see, we see who that is. It's just to make sure that now that we are very close to the winner, that we get it right. Yes. So, so they you seem to have answered, yes. Okay. Awesome. So what was your, oh, we can still ask you for your answer, even though uh, the student win one. 
What would you have answer? Yes, I, I did answer in number two. Yes, so it's about the atomicity, right? You can only have atomic values, no table in a table in a table that's not allowed. So we still have you, still in the game and on Zoom. What's, what is uh, the result on Zoom? Only one left. Leonard Schönefelder. One yes. in Zoom, one on Zoom, one in the room. What is your name? Raphael. And Leon. I'm not saying the last names for a privacy reasons. So Raphael and, and on Zoom? Uh, Leonard. Raphael and Leonard. Okay, so two of you can be the champion. Let's go to a tough one. So the rule is if you both got it, get it wrong, it resets for the both of you, right? So you are, if, if the two get wrong, you still stay up, right? Doesn't eliminate you. So what is, this one is of course something that I might have mentioned, but it's not part of the material of the lecture, but needs to be, uh, we need tough questions as well. What is the second normal form? Is it that an attribute that's not in any candidate key cannot depend on a strict subset of any candidate key? Is it that attributes cannot depend indirectly by transition, by transitivity from a candidate key? Is it that values must be in super atomized form, meaning no strings, you have to have character by character, or is it that the data must form a full dense cube? So just as a hint, some of the answers here actually do correspond to normal forms or are part of the characterization of normal forms, but not necessarily the second one. Thirty-two, thirty-five. Did you answer, Rafael? Yeah. And Leonard, have you answered too? Okay. By the way, I might have mentioned oh, this even today. Yes. One moment, okay. Yeah. Google is not fast enough. <laughs> no, no. Are you ready, yeah. Leonard? Yes, he's ready. Okay. All right. So it was the first answer. I mentioned it today, actually, that an attribute that's not in any candidate key cannot depend on a subset of any candidate key. Right. That wouldn't be a super key. Uh, all right. The second one, depending directly from a candidate key, I think it's the third normal form when you, when you drop that as well. Uh, and the full dense cube could be seen as a much higher normal form that is uh, way beyond the material here. It's the idea that you have all possible combinations of values uh, across columns. But it's the first answer that was correct. So, Rafael. Uh, both out, actually. Oh, both out. Then you can both send up again. Yeah. Okay, so let's. Also, I'm proud to announce I did get it right, but I was torn between the first two options, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> I also sometimes don't recollect exactly which is the second, yeah. which is the third. Yeah. All right. All right. So now, what is a functional dependency? Is it a requirement that the domain depends functionally on the attribute name? Does it express that some attributes stochastically depend on some other attributes following the Markov law? Is it a law that requires that the dimensions in a low lab cube uniquely identify a cell? Or is it expressing that some attributes deterministically depend on some other attributes? I'm asking for the exact definition, right? Not anything that would might be related indirectly. What's the functional dependency? All right. So did you answer? Yes, and on Zoom? Uh, sure. Yes, yes, answered. Okay. So that was the fourth one. You got it right, Rafael and Leonard um, also? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what would you have said? Uh, yeah, I, I would have gotten the correct one. Okay. So let's just because we have we are constrained by time, ten minutes left. 
how can you see a schedule is serializable? Is it because there's a cycle in the graph of the transactions or a cycle in the graph of the queries or because there are no cycles in the graph of the queries or no cycles in the graph of the transactions? This is a two by two OLAP cube, these four answers. All right, did you answer? And on Zoom? Yes. Okay, the short one, no cycles in the graph of the transactions. You have to not look at the individual queries, but your transactions, no cycles. Seems that Rafael got it right, Leonardo as well? Yes. Wow, this is tough. Yeah. Seems like we might have two winners, I don't know. Uh, here's another one. Is it possible to turn the data in a table into voice code normal form if it's not already in a voice code normal form? Maybe the answer is no. Maybe the answer is yes, but iterative, by iteratively decomposing it into overlapping tables based on functional dependencies that break the rule that the left may be a super key, or the same answer, but then it's to disjoint tables or into tables partitioned by sets of rows. Overlapping these joints partitioned by sets of rows or not at all. Did you answer? Yes. And on Zoom? So waiting. Yes. All right, it was overlapping. Remember that you have to join them back. So to join them back, you need a column in common, which is the left-hand side of the of the breaking FD. Okay, Leonard is out. Oh, big applause. Yeah. So Rafael is the champion. So here you go. You have Twix, you have uh, Lindor Kugel, you have Toblerone. So congratulations and enjoy. So now it's 11 52. We can do several things. We can call it a day, call it a weekend. You go, you go early to the Menza. We can answer, answer a few more questions. How do you feel? So, who wants to get more questions? Okay. And on Zoom? Okay. Who doesn't want more questions and wants to go and eat and call it a day? Don't have so many race hands. Okay, so let's continue a bit. We are not going to go, of course, beyond the time, but let's just continue with more questions. How is the data read from disk in a relational database system? In blocks, bit by bit, file by file, or table by table? The, the granularity of the read every time you read something. He fell asleep during the lecture today. Yeah, that's from two days material. All right, let me give you the answer. It is in blocks, right? In blocks or pages, also called pages. This is batch processing, right? This is to avoid latency. If you do it bit by bit, you can come back in 10 years uh, to, to, to have the complete table. Uh, all right. Then we have this. How can you tell a fact table is denormalized as opposed to a fully normalized fact table? Is it that each dimension corresponds to exactly one column, or is it that there's a dimension corresponding to multiple columns that relate to each other via functional dependencies? Or is it that there's multiple measure columns, or is it that there is only one measure column? Denormalized. All right, I'll give you the answer again so we can have more questions. 
The correct answer is that there is a dimension corresponding to multiple columns. It's because you join back with a satellite table, and when you join back, you basically add all the columns from the satellite table. But then you have multiple columns for the same dimension, and indeed, you have the functional dependencies. In fact, these functional dependencies create a hierarchy, right? For example, you have a city, and you join back the country and the continent from the satellite table, but then there's a functional dependency between, between these, right? Again, not in the real world, because if the name of the city is Pfeffikre, uh, then of course that might not work, but this is the general idea. Okay. Then we have, what feature is enabled with limit and offset is SQL? What's the name of that generically, if you use limit and, sequ and offset? Joining tables, paginating results, projecting accounts, controlling the internal data flow. Limit and offsets. By the way, as a reminder, you should use limit and offset after an order by. Otherwise, you can do it, of course, but it doesn't make any sense because there's no, uh, there's no guaranteed order. So select from where group by having order by limit offsets that you must know by heart. That's gonna help you a lot at the exam to know that by heart, to write the queries. All right, paginating results. That's because you can do the first 10, then the next 10, then the next 10, so it's very useful for pages. Uh, yeah? We got a question in Zoom yes? regarding the last question, so maybe if you want to say. Um, uh, someone asked, can you reiterate the meaning of a measure column? Oh, the measure column. So the notion of measure technically is when you have multiple cubes. You could have a cube where the numbers in the cells are the profits of the company, another one where it's the revenues, another one where it's the assets and so on. Uh, and you could uh, have a single fact table for all these cubes, right? But then you need one column for the value of every uh, concept that you are talking about, right? There's a column for the, for the same dimensional coordinates, have a column for the profit, a column for the revenue and so on. Um, but we saw that you can actually pivot by transforming the values, profit, revenue, and so on into another dimension. And the value of that dimension is profit, revenue, and so on. So you can bring yourself back to a single measure, right? So uh, to put it briefly, the measure is what you are talking about. It's the, the, the name of the value that is stored in the cells of the cube. Right? Did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. We can also talk offline, of course, uh, with offline messages. All right. So just a few words on the exam uh, is going to be, I think, the 9th of February. It's all announced. Uh, 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 so what I'm saying now is non-binding. You need to look it up in the system. Um, it's going to be a computer exam. Uh, you will have a Moodle quiz with at most 60 questions. So I told the TA team no more than 60 questions. Uh, and uh, some of the questions, most of them will be theoretical, just multiple choice uh, and so on, no negative points. We also try to give you partial points if you partially answer a question. Um, you will have some SQL queries to write. In that case, we don't grade the query, we grade the results. We ask you a question like how many uh, artists release blah, 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 then you grade, you grade, we grade the answer. But we also ask you to put the query just for archiving. Like if you, if you ask questions later, we have this archived. Uh, so you will have PostgreSQL installed on your computer on the exam day. Uh, it will be all pre-populated. You don't need to worry about anything. It will just work. You'll open a Jupyter notebook. You will click on a few cells and it will just work. And then you can add more queries in the Jupyter notebook. Uh, we'll still share with you uh, what this notebook will be because it will include some cheat sheet with some examples of SQL queries. So you know in advance what you have on exam day. We also tell you what data set it is. So you can also look at the data set in advance uh, so that there's no surprise on exam day. So we do everything we can to reduce your stress, right? Um, any questions on the exam or otherwise we just, Call it a semester. No questions. Also on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, will the exam level format be kind of the same as the Moodle quizzes? Yeah, uh, in the sense that it's similar. It's multiple choice questions and so on. But 
in the Moodle quizzes, we might have sometimes ambiguities or, you know, to trigger discussions to make you think, right? Because then that encourages you to look things up. On the exam, we really polish the questions even more to make them much more precise. So thank you everybody for following the semester. So there's nothing uh, next week. You can just enjoy uh, uh, your Christmas break. Um, thank you everybody for being such a great audience, asking so many questions. Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and Gwete Ruch is Neue Jahr, pick uh, whatever makes sense. Um, and uh, I'll see you, uh, we'll see you at the, at the exam then. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye.